How are you today? No traffic. Um, I, I thought that uh, Beijing uh, is a little, you know, polluted city, uh, and today I, I, it's just like everything is so clear, much clearer than New York City. So I don't know. Uh, I guess fake news or something. I don't know. So we will be discussing today um, a very important topic on alternative data, and we have assembled really a star panelist here. We have uh, Jamie Yu from uh, MSCI. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> CME. Uh, Ellen Wong. We have Alex from Kawut. Elaine Eng from MSCI. And uh, Jeff Lee. If you don't mind, every panelist to briefly introduce yourself and tell us uh, about your company and also a little bit about your background. So maybe we start with with you. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. My name is uh, Jeff Lee, and I'm, I'm currently the CPO of uh, Lufax uh, Holding. So Lufax is the uh, largest financial technology company. China, one of the largest, second largest actually compared to Yen Financial. But we are the uh, largest online wealth management company. So I'm running the product uh, of the company. Uh, my name is Alex Wu. Uh, I'm the CEO for Kava. So Kava is a company based in Seattle. So we use uh, AI and machine learning technologies to build solutions for the buy side firms. Uh, the company was starting to end up 2015. So we have been serving uh, basically hedge funds in New York, uh, London, and also we have customers in China like uh, Wind Financials and uh, DZH as uh, Da Zhe Hui. So, and uh, my background is uh, I have been working in the internet industry for almost uh, 20 years uh, at Google, Microsoft, uh, Baidu. Uh, and also before starting this company, I was CTO for Da uh, Zhe in Shanghai. Uh, so that's why actually uh, we're very excited to share some of the ideas about AI and ultimate data sets for the uh, money management business. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Alan Wang. Um, I'm uh, the head of financial market products at uh, Tiguang. Uh, Tiguang is a mobile developer services company. So uh, app developers uh, use our service uh, here for, for various uh, functions, uh, such as push notifications or SMSs or, uh, or other, uh, other services. Um, yeah, so we uh, currently have over uh, 1.1 million apps that, uh, that use our service um, and as a result of that, uh, we are covering now over uh, 1.07 billion uh, devices, active devices per month in China. Uh, yeah, so uh, given our, our vast coverage base, this is over 90% of all the devices in China, uh, we can mean some, uh, some aspects about these devices that can help uh, our customers, um, you know, whether they be advertisers or apps developers themselves, um, you know, or the financial community, um, you know, to, uh, to to gain insights uh, into into the users uh, and into uh, um, in, into the, kind of the, the the app and the, the hardware markets. Um, uh, so uh, my background is I've always been uh, at investment banks, uh, at Morgan Stanley, um, uh, Barclays, City. Uh, as a research analyst uh, and as an equity salesperson, um, so, um, so I'm running uh, the, these products, uh, particularly as it, as it uh, pertains to uh, investment-related uh, use cases. Um, so happy to answer uh, more questions as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elaine from MSCI, and MSCI is most well known for its index business. Uh, we are the largest provider of indexes, global indexes, to investors all over the world. Uh, what is less well known is we also have an ESG research business. Uh, we are also the largest provider of ESG research globally, but um, it is a very young business for us. Uh, I've been doing, I've been with the firm about eight years now, uh, but four years doing ESG research. So that actually sounds a little bit short in terms of my career, but if you are looking at four years ago, ESG was basically non-existent in the Asian marketplace. So we've really grown very quickly and alongside our clients and the companies that we rate. Um, so I'm going to talk about ESG today. So happy, it's going to be a little bit different, I think. Uh, so happy to take any questions from the audience as well. Jamie? 
Um, hello everyone, my name is Jamie Yu. So I work for CME Group as the Head of Market Technology Sales in the APAC region. Um, so what I do for the company is that I run um, technology, um, business development for technology and data assets. And we also work with strategic partners in emerging technology to develop new solutions around alternative data sets, machine learning applications for capital markets, and those of cloud hosted solutions. And uh, if in the crowd people do not know about CME Group, we are one of the largest journals of change in the world. Since you're the last one who introduced, maybe you can, we can start with you. If you, can, if you don't mind telling us, how is CME and why is CME involved in alternative data set? Okay, um, great question. Uh, we have been uh, looking at alternative data sets for some time, but we've gotten more involved over the last, I would say, three, four years. And we started by doing extensive research with our customer base on uh, who and um, who and how are they interacting with uh, inter alternative data sets today. We also did extensive research on the alternative data vendors around the world, about 160 of them, vendors, platforms, and also brokers uh, for these alternative data sets to understand what are the business challenges that they face and uh, have, where are the gap where um, CME Group can position ourselves in. And some of the findings were that uh, in the equity space, uh, the space is getting quite crowded and uh, it is challenging to find a credible alternative data vendor that can provide credible source to generate consistent alpha. However, there's very little hard data in the commodity space that people can find because there is no government agency that's uh, publishing this data. Uh, and it's mainly done by PRAs and service around the world, which is very um, qualitative. And um, so we started to look deeper and look at the different areas of uh, alternative data sets and start to look at sensor technology and satellite imagery generated data a bit closer. And with that, we've worked with uh, a couple of technology partners to create content that relates to our core markets, uh, which is really commodity derivatives. As you know, we have um, um, agricultural commodity products on the corn and soybean, we have crude oil futures, we have um, metals future. So we develop content that are powered um, by machine learning and satellite imagery on crude oil inventory around the world, copper smelting data, which addresses the production of copper, as well as uh, crop harvesting data uh, to assess what the harvest will be for the crops, uh, such as corn and soybean. Uh, with the latest development on alternative data sets, we've also started to create our own content, our own proprietary sentiment data using our own historical data and using an internally designed proprietary algorithm to assess the event risk in our own markets. Um, since whenever Brexit happens or there's an election happen, uh, many investors come to CME Group to hedge their risk. So we look at the market data and assess the inherent event risk and turn that into a market sentiment meter. And all these um, digital data content, including our um, CME's own pricing information and these alternative data sets, are um, all contained within a web data portal, uh, which is hosted uh, by a cloud uh, called DataMine. Thank you so much. Elaine, MSCI, huge company. Why are you not turn to data? How you analyze big data and incorporate it into, into ESG type of investments? Yeah, so I think way before alternative data was coined, uh, we have been doing ESG research for about 20 something years now. Um, and over the last 10, 15 years, we've started incorporating back then what, what we now call alternative data into our models. Um, so we actually was at a hedge fund uh, gathering in New York uh, a couple of months ago, and one of the hedge fund managers was like, we have been using alternative data all along, it's now called ESG data. So uh, terms aside, uh, when you talk about alternative data at, in, ES, in the ESG frame, framework or context, it's really about taking non-financial information and incorporating that into financial analysis. 
And the reason why we started doing that is because we wanted to see if there were, no, we believe that there are material issues faced by companies that cannot be accurately captured in financial, by financial ratios and financial statements. And these could lead to very large, uh, heavy drawdowns uh, on company uh, uh, stocks, for example. And these, at a, at a portfolio level, will lead to uh, detrimental financial performance. So, uh, we have a, a massive data team. We collect alternative data into our models, and they make up about 45% of the ultimate rating of a company. So what, what, what alternative data are we really talking about? Um, if you've uh, kept up with um, the international financial news, you will know that this last week, Equifax, which is an American credit rating agency, personal credit rating agency, was fined uh, over $700 million because of a failure in their security systems, which led to a hack and loss of uh, over a million customer accounts. I think this was maybe two years back. So back in those days, back, back two years ago, we had already flagged Equifax for very poor data privacy and security management. Um, and we downgraded that particular company prior to this uh, latest hack, the 140 something million accounts being lost. So I think that you know taking such information into account can help advise and inform, advi uh, inform investors about the potential risk that is faced by the company. And these risks are starting to emerge, these risks are starting to grow uh, more and more and affect more and more companies and across industries. Alex, your business is very, very interesting. Um, you, can you tell us the sources of your data and how hedge fund managers can monetize them? Yeah, actually, um, so, so, in the, so I'm going to talk about from the buy side, right? So because we mostly work with the um, uh, hedge fund managers and uh, traders and investors. So from that perspective, right, so the first question is really about why, why do we want to use authentic data? So why, why do we want it in the first place? So if you, if you look at this question, right, so it's really, it's really about the information and also the space is getting so competitive. So if you look at the financial markets, there are, there are like uh, 50,000 stocks globally. Right? But if you look at the liquid stocks, like in the United States, people are talking about 500 or 1,000 uh, stocks, right? also 1,000. In, in China, people are talking about, for example, CSI 300. So it's a very crowded space, but the, if you look at hedge fund space, there are like 15,000 15, hedge fund managers that are trying to compete against each other. So this is very, very crowded. Then the question is, how do you get the urge? So alternative data and AI definitely offer a solution and an urge for the, all these financial firms, because yes, for the fan, traditional financial data, we have been doing that for so many years, like in the last 40 years, we have seen almost 400 different factors have been discovered by different hedge fund managers and also the uh, professors uh, in the academics, right? Uh, but then the question becomes, what's next, right? So you have to go to authentic data set to give you extra information. And besides that, you also need AI and machine learning actually give the capability to extract the useful alpha and information from the authentic data. Because in most of the authentic data like Elan said, for example, tax data are very noisy and the information density is very low. So in this case, the traditional quantitative met methodology doesn't work. And machine learning has been used in Google, Microsoft, and Baidu. It's very good at building all these weak learners using, using the sparse data sets, right? especially authentic data sets. So that's why we think the combination of AI and authentic data sets really is going to be the next big win. And that's also what we see uh, in the last few months, right? We see uh, Nasdaq acquire Condo, right? And also uh, Refinity uh, invest a lot of money in Battlefield. Right? Battlefield is another uh, authentic data provider. And, and a few days ago, right, LSC is also doing like a $27 billion deal to acquire Refinity. So I think the trend is really getting there, right? And especially the, the big players in 
globally, they are trying to get into this data business, especially our payment data business, uh, plus AI. I think we're very interested about this new trend. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Alan, um, if you don't mind telling us uh, your company, uh, where do you get the data, who are your clients, how they use your data, and also a little bit about regulations, because that's very uh, important aspect of what you do. Uh, sure, that's a broad topic, but let me go through it one by one. Uh, so, Jiguang, um, so our, our core business uh, is, is uh, with the developers, right? So developers ask us um, you know, to help them um, perform certain functions that you know, otherwise they would have to spend money uh, and time doing themselves. But because we have the scale, we can help them do it more faster, uh, more efficiently. Uh, more, uh, in a more stable uh, manner. Uh, so, um, you know, our, our biggest kind of function that we help the app developers do is the push notification, uh, which is when you have your phone, um, you know, and the pop-ups come up, you know, we're helping them, you know, uh, send those messages uh, to their users. So they tell us, you know, who to send it to, what to send, and we use our over 6,000 servers um, to uh, send it in the, in the best way. Um, you know, and these things are, are very important because if you order uh, food or order a car and it doesn't get through, then you know that's a that's a very uh, negative experience for their users. So um, you know, so so we help them to do things like this. Also, other functions such as SMS or um, you know even Internet of Things. You know, we have uh, certain functions uh, that that we can help them do. Um, you know, so it comes in a in a code called a SDK. Uh, kind of plug it into their app. Uh, you know, and that's that's how they can use it. Um, you know, right away. Right. So. So this is what we do for, for the apps, and as a result, you're now, since we're in over a million apps, um, and getting access to over a billion phones, you know, what, what, you know, what kind of data are we seeing? The data that we're seeing is kind of things that we need to see in order to perform these functions. So if they tell us who to send it to, they have to sell, tell us um, the device number, which phone it is, um, you know, who, who it is. Um, we have to know where they are. Um, you know, because if they send it, say, send it to everyone in Beijing, you know, then we have to know that the, the phones are located in Beijing. Um, you know, so this kind of data um, uh, we get. Uh, you know, so um, you know, we add it up, right? Uh, since we have such a large sample size um, of, of over over a billion, um, you know, that um, we can then get access or gain insights into uh, various things that, that are important, um, such as you know, which apps are the most prevalent. Um, you know, within within China, right? Which apps are used the most? Um, you know, where are they used? Um, you know, what kind of phones um, you know, are, are are they using? Um, you know, so we add it up, then we can get um, trends, and we can see um, you know which games are getting gaining more popularity, which apps are gaining more popularity, which phones are gaining more popularity or losing, right? Um, you know, so um, you know, so our source of the data is going to be with the developers and the apps. Um, you know, and the, the data that we're getting helps us uh, you know, get insight into trends on um, uh, software and hardware uh, and location, right? So, um, you know, how do our clients use this data you know, to make money, right? M many different ways. So I have clients in the VC, PE space, I have clients uh, at our hedge funds, I have quant clients, um, you know, mutual funds, pension funds, um, you know, they, they, they all find this useful uh, for various ways. So they're short term, um, you know, where, um, for example, uh, there was, there's, a, there's a live streaming app you know, uh, for esports you know, called, called Huya. And we saw in December that, oh wow, their, their users are, are gaining very, very quickly, right? Um, you know, and, and I don't know why, but that's what we saw, right? So this is the data that we saw. Um, you know, so you know, if you bought the stock then, you know, the stock didn't move until January because uh, by January the company started announcing that oh we have new functions um, you know uh, in our live streaming um, you know plus one of the competitors was dying and we're taking their host and you know our, our user base is growing considerably but the stock went up by almost 100% uh, in the next two months but we knew that a month ahead right yeah, so that's a very easy you know short term trade that you can do right um, but if you're a longer term uh, holder uh, of a stock then. You know, having you know uh, our data, you know, can help you uh, with your conviction levels, right? So markets go up and down, you know, but if the data is still supportive, then the next time there's a blip, you know, in the markets, then you won't be, you won't be, uh, you know, panicked and sell. You might even add more because oh, I have very high conviction, you know, on this on this idea. Uh, and a lot of a lot of alpha is generated this way. 
right? So you have short term, you have long term. Uh, even on the quant side, you know, just using purely our data, you know, we created a strategy, you know, where um, you know, there's, a, there's a long short monthly rebalance um, using our, you know, our, our user metrics, um, you know, and, and over the last three years, uh, it's been able to uh, return over 40% with a two sharp, you know, which is you know quite good, right? Uh, annually, um, you know, so. Um, you know, so so there's lots of different use cases that we that we can do, and that's just on the app side. Um, you know, and then we can go deeper. You know, even for real estate. You know, if if you want to, um, you know, check out the the foot traffic in a certain location, right? We're getting over 10 billion location points a day now. Um, you know, so if you're if you want to do a site a site analysis, you know, or checking out, um, you know, whether whether this location is a good location, you know, then we then we can help with that as well. Right. So these are just some of the um, the, the examples um, you know, that, that our users um, uh, find find us helpful in. Uh, in terms of regulation, um, I think it's uh, it's important you know to to know where your data is coming from, um, you know, and and to know that you're not selling anyone's personal information. I mean, um, yeah, I think the gentleman yesterday you know said said that you know China is a little more relaxed on this. Well, actually, you know, China is also sensitive. Um, you know, China doesn't want you know. Um, um, any any apps or any uh, sources, you know, to get data they're not really supposed to get, right? Um, and also, you know, China doesn't want anyone selling someone's personal information individually, um, you know, out, outside, right? So, um, so it's not a free for all, right? You know, so uh, where does where does Yiguan play in this, right? So we get our data via our operations, right? Um, you know, which is you know, one of the one of the conditions, you know, for for getting data. Our data is self sourced versus a lot of other providers who buy the data, right? When you buy the data as a third party, you don't know where it's coming from. Um, plus, you don't know if there's, um, you know, if, if there's agreements for you to, to, to acquire this data. Um, for us, you know, we uh, have agreements with every single developer that we work with. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, it's, it's all there in black and white that we can acquire this data. That's on the acquisition side. On the selling side, you know, none of our products um, in, in the whole company um, uh, have anything to do with individuals, right? Uh, you know, so we're selling everything on an aggregated basis. It's anonymous, right? So that's important, okay? Um, also, uh, when you're talking about personal information, we don't really get personal information. Um, you know, we're we're getting um, uh, kind of metadata, you know, kind of uh, 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 non-personal information, such as your device number, um, you know, or you know which apps you know are, are installed. Um, you know, uh, which phone you know this, this 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 user is right, but we don't get things like social security numbers or transaction accounts or, or anything related to that. Um, so I think th those are the main the key points when you talk about regulation. Um, you know how you get the data. Um, you know uh, whether it's anonymous, whether it's uh, individual, um, you know, and whether it's personal information, and whether you're supposed to you're supposed to get it. Um, so hopefully that, that answers your question. Thank you very much. Uh, three questions in one. Uh, moving uh, from uh, institutional space to maybe retail space, so-called. Um, Jeff, if you can explain to us uh, how your company deals with uh, finding, or I would say screening um, customers on the, on the risk uh, parameters basis. Sure, yeah. So, Utilizing uh, alternative data and AI. Right, right. So, you know, our company conducted the business pretty much all online, right? So, uh, Lufax is the affiliate of the uh, Pingman Group. Uh, and Ping on, as you know, is a Pingan bank, it's securities and uh, funds. Um, so to differentiate, you know, from them, uh, we uh, pretty much we connect with our customers either through the cell phone or through the uh, 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 you know WeChat or or any uh, other kind of media. So in order to do that, uh, we don't have the luxury of meeting individuals in face, right, in person, so understand their risk profile. Um, all our so-called uh, customers' pictures, uh, we uh, try to gather, um, you know, from our system is pretty much based on the behavior information, behavior information on, on our platform, and also we kind of work with the other uh, data vendor to gather the, uh, the information as well. So then, you know, we look at the uh, uh, individuals' uh, risk profile in almost a multi-dimension. One is the uh, the ability uh, to take the risk, and also the uh, the willingness to take the risk and also the attitude towards the risk, and in this this kind of you know multi-dimension uh, information is based on the completely based on the behavior on the on the website. You know, what kind of products they're interested, um, 
and then we guess their lifestyle and what stage and also project their future uh, kind of life path. So based on that, we have a good understanding on the customers what they want and also what sort of risk they can, they can, uh, they can take. And then the second portion when we use the alternative data is actually the product side. Uh, on the platform, we have roughly about 5,000 uh, financial products, um, you know, various from mutual funds, hedge funds, and private equity funds, and also a lot of soft products. Um, so, you know, to understand the risk characteristics of the products, we have to go down very deep on what kind of assets it kind of linked to, that work with the manager, the manager's uh, uh, management skills and styles, and also any kind of change in regulations on, on the company they invested. So, and, and all this kind of information uh, gathered either from outside or from external, you know, kind of have a good picture of the product. So once we have these two, and then we try to do a matching. So the matching is not just say, you know, when we deliver the solution to the customers, it's not just look at the, uh, the simple efficient frontier, this very typical global advisory people kind of doing, right? So picking five points, from the other side, and then get the portfolio, five portfolio, and then recommend to different kind of uh, customers. So on our side, we um, because we look at this not just the volatility, but we also look at uh, many uh, kind of uh, uh, risk characteristics as well. So in that case, we create or both say every individual will have his own solution. That's kind of you know matching we're talking about, and then this kind of matching is also kind of dynamically changed based on the market condition and also based on the. Uh, person's lifestyle change, and also based on, you know, the, uh, uh, the other type of uh, uh, factors. So, you know, in that the three part, then we have a pretty complete, uh, I would say, you know, customized, uh, curated solution to, uh, uh, to our customers. So that's how we, we can utilize the... Uh, the Thank you, fascinating. Thank you. So we'll move a little bit from specifics of what each company does. We will, you know, have some questions related to that as well, but let's move on and uh, talk a little bit more in general terms. So, for example, uh, Jamie, if you don't mind telling us how this alternative data set is evolving um, in the future, what do you see, how is the trend? Um, so, I think from our lens of looking at the alternative data space, it's very much a, a narrow lens of how are our customers interacting with our markets? How are they interacting with our products? I think we've started to see an evolvement uh, from the high frequency trading world, uh, which only emerged, I would say, maybe within the last decade, that they are starting to acknowledge that uh, the latency game is, uh, is not going to be the main alpha differentiator in the longer term. And it's, it's uh, being accelerating at a pace that these technology investments in through uh, microwave technology you heard about the Go West project that has been more initially started as a consortium of prop firms um, building their own um, closed loop on that tech and now commoditizing it to the broad scope. It's become a utility. So I think in terms of um, the shift to how people will be using alternative data sets in the future, I think one thing that needs to be acknowledged is that it's not a binary decision of looking at the pricing information that may be considered traditional data versus alternative data sets and needs to be looked at side by side. And I think that paradigm shift, um, although we've been looking at it for a couple of years, but I, I think it's really starting to grow just really now. Uh, there was a research done in 2017 that showed about um, one out of every four asset managers in the U.S. were already using alternative data sets. Two years now uh, from, from, from then, um, I think what we see right now is that people are growing the awareness about the alternative data sets, but we're still at the early stages of understanding how best to interpret it and what it means. When I talk to um, customers about alternative data sets, some people say, can you not talk to everybody about this? Because if everybody knows, then where's the alpha? Um, we, we see it differently uh, because people can interpret that data differently and it is not a shortcut. It's not a shortcut to the training answers, although the rationale of us looking into this is to provide actual insights to our customers. So people don't need to only think in the sense of being the flow versus being the market makers that scalping in between. There has to be a more macro way of looking at the markets. 
Um, so I would say how things are evolving is that the, the awareness is growing and um, being able to, the ability to be able to consume the data and calculate the data, make sense of it, uh, generate it, and uh, translate it into a consistent training signals, that process, there's many links in between. And, uh, and that relates to the adoption of cloud services with our customers, and that relates to the investments by the customers to set up dedicated desk to look at alternative data sets. And we see that starting to happen with the Western counterparts. But I think Asia is still uh, early stages at this point, from what we see. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Eileen, if we can continue, tell us a little bit more about what do you think of the same question? And also, if we can add what the challenges you see as well in the front. Yeah, thanks. And I really wanted to pick up that, because uh, when you talk about Okay, so in our we, we we release a paper at the start of every year talking about the major ESG trends that we expect to see. So in the 2019 paper, we talked about the big signal revolution. So I want to differentiate between big data and big signal. So data and signal are two different things because data is can be everywhere, but really you need to be able to assimilate that and understand how it works for you become before it becomes a signal. And signal is what we want, right? So too much data without you knowing what to do with it, without your conviction, your own point of view, it remains just noise. So signal is extremely important, and I think this is the growing area that um, uh, has a lot of opportunities because there's so much data available out there. Uh, a major problem that we face in the ESG industry has been over the last 10 years People saying that, or investors saying that, does it really help with my financial performance? Is it a drag on my performance? I don't really want to do ESG, I don't want to save the world, in that sense, at my own cost. So, the, I think the, the responsibility of all alternative data providers and users of that data is to make sure that you test it in your own portfolios, for example, if you're an investor. So we have done research to show that our data um, will help with your portfolio management if you, on the management of your downside risk. So it's not really just always talking about pressing ahead with alpha, but it's really managing your long-term risk, managing your portfolio as a whole to prevent any sort of uh, unexpected drawdowns or unexpected uh, losses in your portfolio. So that, that reality of whether the data or the signal works for you must always reside with the user of the data. And this is a continuous challenge that uh, I think everyone in the alternative data uh, world faces and needs to overcome. Thank you very much. Uh, the following questions are for Alan and Alex. Um, you guys go to US and China back and forth. So uh, what are the real differences between alternative data in the United States and in China, in terms of cleaning and the process, um, if you can elaborate on that. Um, I see a few differences. Uh, I think in the US, uh, the alternative data space has been around longer. Uh, so it's actually very, very mature, actually. Um, and, and now you're seeing uh, the users actually, they used to just adopt any kind of data that they would get, right? So they were buying a lot. Now they're cutting back and being very, um, uh, very careful and, and, and very uh, scrutinizing uh, about what they what they buy and what they use now, right? So um, in, in in that sense, the U.S. is a is a more mature market. Um, in China and in Asia, um, you know, this uh, is still a growing space. It's still very new, um, and the adoption uh, is really just picking up. Um, you know, so I think uh, the, the the phases are are different there. Um, other differences that I see is that China. It seems that, uh, at least in my space, um, a lot of people are saying, oh, I have all global data except China, right? Um, China data seems to be a little more difficult to get, um, um, whether it's because of uh, different restrictions uh, you know, on, the, on the internet or just the different uh, ecosystems, uh, et cetera. Yeah, so, um, so China data seems to be more valuable uh, you know, than the rest of the world uh, because it's uh, more difficult to get. Um, another, you know, Difference or challenge, and maybe this exists in the U.S. as well. You know, but yeah, I think if you're looking to adopt uh, alternative data, um, 
the quality of the data, uh, you really need to be careful about. Um, you know, the, 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 the space, you know, it, it's hard to tell sometimes whether uh, you know, the, the data is, is trustworthy, if it's, if it's real, if it's coming from um, the sources that, uh, you know, that the providers say that it's coming from. You know, so I would, I would say as a, as a potential user, you should be careful in, uh, in, in adopting just, just kind of any data and you do, do, your, do your homework. Um, uh, as, as well, so um, yeah, so these are some of the, the differences that I see, you know, from the, from the U.S. and China. Um, I want to talk more about the common challenges. I think I think U.S. and China, in in general, is very similar. So everybody's facing the same challenges. So it's like uh, our technology is pretty new, right? because it's new. So which means when we're doing these kind of data sets, the the coverage is very sparse, right? And also, we don't have longer history of data sets. So that's actually the same challenge for everybody. Right? We talk to uh, managers in the United States, in London. We talk to managers in China. So everybody's facing the same thing. Right? Uh, everybody's trying to get better risk and return. And but then we're facing the same, same, same challenges. So that's the uh, common thing. But the difference is really about the acceptance rate. Right? Because when we talk to uh, money managers in China, then less willing to try authentic data sets or they don't think that that's going to be very useful for them but when we talk to the managers in for example new york or london they are more like eager to get into the space or sourcing the data from united states but also europe other countries but especially china actually we tell them that the china data may have lower quality uh, they have a lot of sparsity, but still, they are very, very ambitious to try this kind of thing because they really want to get their, their competition edge. So that's actually, uh, uh, that's actually what, what we see, uh, the, the difference of uh, people's opinion uh, in the US and US channel. Thank you, Alex. So we discussed quite a bit on alternative data sets. Uh, let's move a little bit on AI. And so Jeff, if you can tell us your company specifically, what does it do uh, to your retail clients? Sure, yeah. Um, well, the, uh, well, certainly, you know, first the challenge we're talking about is the, uh, uh, which had to do a little bit more on the sort of know your, know our customers' intention, right? So not just knowing who they are, but try to get to know, when they click on certain things, you know, what exactly they want to buy or sell, you know, some of the products, and also what, what do they really want. So in order to achieve that, um, we need to gather lots of their behavior information, uh, but just just such as uh, you know what kind of article they're interested in and what kind of uh, the news they're interested, in, what sort of sectors they may be interested, in, so that we can actually recommend some of the related product to them. But in order to do that, it's uh, uh, we just feel that the information is just not enough, right? So the, uh, the short history of this information and also especially on our platform and also enable uh, to you know, for us to purchase from the other places, that creates a lot of challenge. So, you know, we feel that at this moment, it's a simple kind of, you know, survey versus, you know, analyzing the behavior on the platform, it's like, which one is uh, more straightforward. That's kind of challenge. But related to the AI, um, we have uh, multiple so-called the, um, the robots, you know, in the, in the service, right? So one is the, um, you know, out, the out call, uh, calling out kind of robot, I don't know what's the English word, is, yeah? almost an outbound cold calling kind of, kind of robot. So based on the information we gather, we try to approach to the new customer. And then the other one is like, uh, based on the, um, uh, when they try to subscribe or purchase on some of the products on, on our website, it's kind of breaking down in some of the area, we can automatically reach out to them and figure out, ask the question. So that's a little bit more on the customer service uh, type of uh, robot. And then the, uh, the third one, I would say, is the wealth management chatbot. So the chatbot is a little bit more sophisticated. You know, if you ask a question about, hey, what kind of uh, mutual fund is suitable for me, and, and then ask any specific information about a particular fund, and then the chatbot should be able to answer the question for, uh, for the customer. So that is the you know, multiple uh, kind of AI uh, technology that we apply. You know, in the in servicing the uh, the customers, so that's one end. I mean, on the other hand, certainly the AI on building up the product, the global, the global side, and then overlaying with the macro uh, factors, and then the macro came from the other uh, 
uh, type of you know, big data either from the Stata image or from the other places or the alternative data, we can actually apply overlay to the uh, investment strategy. So in that case, the, the asset allocation is not just a simple um, you know, risk-based or risk-factor-based risk kind of allocation or, or, or kind of you know, simple uh, invariance uh, uh, optimization, right? So we have uh, uh, the other kind of data overlay you know, on that. So hopefully we can achieve a little bit more on the, um, you know, the alpha uh, by, look, by, uh, by kind of, you know, for different kind of uh, customers and then we recommend a different type of solution you know, for that. So overlay with and uh, you know, liquid investment strategy and so on and so forth to achieve the additional outcome. You create portfolio construction uh, as well utilizing AI. You can do uh, efficient frontier curve. Can you explain in terms of sophistication, uh, what level of sophistication are you trying to reach uh, since your clients are retail, they're not uh, right. they're not so, so we, we also feel that you know, in order to have a better or the enhanced uh, efficient frontier, we, we need to have a bigger asset uh, sets, right? So you know, and also the better asset uh, category and sets. Uh, so in Ping An, we have, uh, you know, because the group is huge, and then we have, uh, uh, we have the ability to access you know, more, uh, you know, better products and better assets, right? So you know, for example, you know, some of the, uh, and one of the trust company that Ping An owns, and typically we have uh, you know, better real estate assets. So in that case, we feel that, you know, these kind of, you know, um, Assets can generate additional alpha, you know, for us. So the curve, uh, if you look at that, it's uh, you know we try to move up, right? So in in the in the x-axis, we are not just looking at the uh, volatility size, and the, as I mentioned before, look at multi dimension of the risk, um, you know, to to kind of match to the customer's risk profile. And then on the uh, on the return side, um, we have different kind of uh, investment horizons and, and the liquidity type of uh, you know, assets, so that the portfolio, if it's the high high net worth individual, and then we can recommend you know, some of the liquid assets you know, in, in the solution. If it's just a, you know, a, a mass affluent or a mass uh, investors, so that will be more traditional type of assets uh, portfolio you know, for, for that. So you know, you know, when we combine with this uh, classical investment you know, theory on, 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 on that, on, and then on top, you know, overlay with the, uh, with the information, we feel that we have an edge to access and then create a better strategy. So that's how we achieve a higher return you know, for that. So, you know, it's just like different horizon. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the customer solution may be just not the risk level, but also the kind of investment horizon. You know, how long they want to hold the portfolio, how long they want to have the solutions for, right? So it's a six months, one year, three year, or three year above. So based on the sophisticated matrix, we can recommend different kind of solutions for that. Thanks, Jeff. Back to Jeremy. Um, how do your company views uh, this ecosystem, machine learning, AI? Um, I know that if you can maybe uh, discuss also uh, who your customers are and uh, how you actually serve them differently. Um, we, I, I will not be able to share uh, the exactly who our customers are, but perhaps I can talk a little bit about the uh, machine learning application that we developed. So it's actually quite simple. Um, so we looked at our own order book data and transformed the order book of volume prices into 3D dimensional images. And uh, we are using uh, machine learning methods to analyze the data and apply an application called the order book search. Now what it does is that um, customers can come to the portal and they can request to see 20 seconds of data, analyze historical data, whether there's patterns that looks like what's happening within that 20 second that are requested. Now that's the first step. So it looks at the same underlying products, historical data, as well as other underlying. So they analyze, say, um, for example, S&P had a gap down in the market open. When has this happened? When has the order book pattern looked the same? They can look back in ES. They can look at in other things like US Treasuries. Uh, and then what's next is that, then in the historical data patterns, what happened next? what happened in the next 20 seconds, and then they can, we can generate a predictive insight based on that. But it's a very simple application, I would say. It's, it's um, really, um, it, it was really more to um, educate on the pattern recognition aspects of machine learning that can be adopted 
for the microstructure data. Uh, similar questions to Elaine, um, how NSCI integrates machine learning and deep learning and NLP into your ESG process? Yeah, so <clears throat> with machine learning, um, what we are doing right now is to look for emerging issues. Um, so we, we connect companies and investors. So basically we get from the investors uh, what is um, the areas of concern, what they're trying to manage, and what their investment problems are. And then on the ground, we keep our ears very close to the ground by listening to what companies have to say about their own business. So we have started using NLP um, to listen to all of the earnings calls for we started in the US. So basically then picking up keywords and themes about what is preoccupying companies. So uh, in again in our 2019 trends to watch, one of the items that we picked up was uh, about plastics. And uh, the reason we started to de uh, dig deeper into this is because uh, we saw a 340% spike in the number of times plastic waste was actually uh, talked about at earnings calls between 2017 and 2018. Right? So this is something that was preoccupying companies. And we've also seen that from then, uh, 2018 to now, Companies in the packaging industry um, who have innovative uh, paper products as replacement for plastics are also seeing rise in their revenues. So this is actually an emerging opportunity, area of opportunity, as well as risk uh, for, for, for companies who are slower moving. So that is one thing to do. Um, the other thing that we are looking to uh, improve on our process is then using, again, so this sort of uh, information on the ground to help us understand if companies are evolving. So, uh, this might sound very old school, but uh, with companies, we classify them into rigid classification uh, for, for purposes of investments. So, like the gigs classification, for example. You just, pick, you just put a company into consumer staples, for example, when they may not necessarily be because uh, strategies are evolving. So we are keeping an eye to see whether or not these companies are changing in a certain way so that if there are new risks that they are exposed to, we can then very quickly uh, make sure that we start evaluating them and take that into our model. And the last thing uh, that we are doing is to then improve transparency for, for our investor clients. So there, within, in the ESG world, there are now almost every single asset manager out there who claims that they have ESG capabilities, funds that are green and, or blue or rainbow or whatever color it is out there. And what we're trying to do now is to dig into the portfolio to see whether or not you know, they are actually executing on their strategies, whether they are, they are, they are really do, uh, as green as they propose to be or as ESG as they claim to be. So these are three things that we are continuously improving on. Thanks, Alan. Um, so moving uh, back from uh, AI to data sets again, um, Alan, you have uh, hedge funds, uh, their clients, uh, PE, uh, private equity, right, venture capital, mutual funds. So uh, if you can tell us how you know each one of them use alternative data, what do you do for them? And you know, obviously they are different clients, so. So yeah, so I think each each type of client can use our data a little differently. Um, you know, so uh, I would say um, our more traditional client would be like a like a hedge fund, a long short uh, client, right? Um, you know, who, where they're looking for ideas, um, they're looking for ideas and, and, and kind of uh, both the long and the short side. Um, you know, so whenever there's inflection points in the data, um, so some of the key metrics that we have include um, uh, the install base um, of, of any app. Um, yeah, the, uh, the the daily active users, uh, the time spent uh, on apps, um, you know, and the, the demographics, right, uh, you know, of, of each app. So, um, you know, when these metrics show either an inflection point or a trend, um, you know, that is not priced into the market, you know, then they can dig deeper uh, and, and and use that uh, and to see if that's a you know that's that's worthwhile trading on. Right, so I would say you know it, it's not as simple as uh, you know oh our number says it's going up and you should therefore buy um, you know because if it was that easy then everyone would do it and then the apple would be gone immediately um, you know then you have to look at something else um, you know I, I would say we're helping um, you know those with domain knowledge those who already know the companies um, know it even better 
uh, helping them model out, helping them try to try to predict um, you know, what's going to happen in the next quarter, or the next half year, or the next year, right? Um, so that's a traditional kind of a hedge fund long short uh, way, right? Um, you know, for a longer term, you know, investor, you know, why would they buy our data? Uh, I think one of the kind of misperceptions maybe is that you know, alternative data is used only you know for short term trading types. Um, you know, but no, longer term, um, you know, if you're if you're a long term holder of a of a stock, um, you know, then we. Our data can help you, you know, confirm whether it's worth still holding onto the stock, um, you know, and whether we should add to it when there's any kind of uh, opportunities, um, you know, or uh, when when you should start to sell out uh, because we see inflection points. You know, so um, you know, one example is uh, this, this classified company called Uba Fifty Eight dot com. So they don't really release these kind of numbers, but we have these numbers. Um, you know, the, the users uh, user stats, for example. Um, you know, and in early 2017, um, you know, we saw a trough in these numbers, so at the bottom. Uh, and since then, you know, for the next year, year and a half, uh, it, uh, their, their numbers went up you know, quite considerably, two to three times. Um, you know, and uh, you know, and if if you were following the stock at the same time, the stock was also rising. Um, you know, uh, almost at the same rate. Um, you know, so therefore, it's a it's a good proxy to see whether okay, whether um, you know. It, it, if you're a classified site, then users are quite important, right? So, uh, so whether you should still hold on to this, or should I add more, or not, right? So, if I'm a long-term holder of this, I want to see that this data, you know, every month, every day, you know, is still on track, and therefore I can still hold it or add even more, right? Uh, and, and make it a core holding, um, you know. So, so lo uh, long-term, um, you know, mutual fund, pension funds, uh, they also use our data this way. Um, the quads are, um, you know, a, a, a bit different, right? Um, you know, in in that. They're trying to get all the data at once and analyze, you know, which one is, um, you know, what, what to do, any kind of strategies, right? Um, traditionally, at first, um, you know, I thought that okay, they're going to try to use only our data, you know, and try to get ideas either through correlations or uh, long short strategies, um, you know, uh, according to kind of the, the data and how it changes. Um, I think this is still true, um, you know, but I've seen more adoption recently. Um, you know, because they're integrating our data with their other data sets uh, and maybe adding to that or uh, putting two data sets together you know, can maybe add more alpha you know, than using just one. And I think as the sophistication of the, of the more systematic and, and quant clients uh, grows, um, you know, we're seeing more of this. So I would say last year, you know, they didn't really want to talk to me uh, because either you know, my history wasn't long enough or uh, my, uh, the stocks I cover were too narrow. Um, and this year, there's a lot, a lot more adoption, a lot more uh, interest um, because now they find, oh, we can use it you know, with our other uh, data sets and enhance that even more. You know, um, you know, so I think uh, uh, depending on you know, who you are, uh, you use it differently. Oh, lastly, the VC and PE clients, they're using it um, to look at the really small uh, apps, the really small kind of companies, and seeing if there's any kind of huge growth, um, you know, and trying to find that that next uh, uh, big company. Um, so they're using us a little bit as a screening tool, a little bit as a due diligence tool because it's harder to get uh, information on private companies. Um, you know, so um, you know, so they also use it uh, a bit differently. So um, you know, so there's a kind of a, a use case for, for everybody, I guess. Thanks. Uh, how AI differentiates from traditional uh, to quant models, Alex? And the same question for, for Jeff, but we don't have much time, so we can just be quick in that answer, please. Yeah, actually, uh, if you think about the uh, quantitative investment, right, it has been there for, for many, many years, right? And, and But the traditional financial models, we use a lot of factors. So when we talk about factors, right, these are very strong relationships, right, statistically. But when we talk about machine learning, it's really about we use something called features, signals, which means these are some of the very like a weak relationships. But the machine learning models can be very good, especially deep learning models, can be very good actually to learning from the data sets by combining a lot of weak relationships, come with some very, very interesting insights about which stocks you buy, which stocks you sell. But that's actually why we see a lot of success. Uh, by using these kind of new technologies, and, and especially come to our new data sets, right? This has become even more so, and that's why when we work with some of the best set firms, they're very excited to try the new thing. But if you think about this, like two or three years ago, uh, when we talked to the hedge fund managers about saying, hey, why, "Why do you want to use computers?" Right? 
because I can do it myself. But if you think about today, actually, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, buy side firms are getting to try, to try these new technologies right now. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks for the question. Well, the, uh, if you look at the, uh, the quant strategies, uh, you know, from various mutual funds, it could be uh, uh, quite different, right? So you look at the model of, uh, say, AQR, um, they believe, you know, all this kind of uh, factors has to have uh, economic uh, meaning, right? So it has to be explained by, by financial theory. So, you know, their approach of analyzing and also validating and also using the factor to design the strategy could be very different than the other type of firms like, say, Wokong, right? So, you know, they, you know, Wokong, they, they, they employ thousands of uh, uh, kind of data scientists to kind of try to figure out the signal. And then they may not really care there's a financial theory behind to support uh, to, as long as it works, and then that's it. They kind of change uh, using the signal to develop their, their own strategy. So I think, you know, in, in, in my opinion, in the long run, um, especially, you know, in the investment area, I, in order to achieve alpha, these two has to be you know kind of combined, right? So you cannot just uh, based on the traditional data and the development strategy that, that you cannot just have a, you know based on the alternative data without understanding the meaning behind it, whether the strategy can be sustained, right? So that I would see in future will be interesting uh, kind of approach and how this will converge. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let's round of applause for our panelists. This is a great session.